Okay, um, a lot of the tough house, for those of you who are intimately familiar with California, which I assume is all of you, will be just a refresher course, but I would like to set the stage by first mentioning this is this graph here, which is one of my favorite slides to use these days, uh, uh, created by um, Mike Dettinger. Anyway, it basically shows the variability in rainfall uh, nationwide. And what you notice, all the dark colored dots are in California. We had the most variable climate of any place uh, from a rainfall perspective of any place in the country. And that, that does tell you that droughts are always with us and are always going to be, uh, uh, be, a, be a problem or it's what our fauna is adapted to. Um, and of course, we're in the fourth year of a very severe drought. Uh, I'll believe El Nino when it happens, but uh, and especially here in Northern California, there's some question about how well, much water we'll actually get. But the um, the Sierra Nevada snowpack, our biggest reservoir, really, is much worse than we thought. The uh, where we were at a 500-year low, as the newspapers reported repeatedly. Uh, some water stored in our reservoirs has fallen, which is why we have such uh, so many drought emergencies right now. And California, is on top of this, is, expecting, is experiencing record heat. And it's the heat plus low rainfall that really makes it hard uh, for our native flora and fauna. Uh, and just to give you some perspective, though, I do want to do a brief comparison based on work done at the Center for Watershed Sciences of three sectors in California that uh, are affected by the drought, the cities, farms, and the environment. First off, cities, you know, cities have done pretty well. Uh, during this drought. Uh, the investments they've made in infrastructure have really paid off. They've been thinking about this for a long time. Uh, there's a lot of regional cooperation that's developed. Uh, and the conservation is working. I'm sure you've seen headlines like this frequently that California urban water use drops 27.3% exceeding the 25% mandate. So if people have been willing to save water, and the cities have been doing pretty well. So the economic effects of the drought on urban areas ha has been surprisingly small. Uh, in agriculture, of course, this is what the image I think most people have what's going on in California agriculture. Everything's drying up. But the reality is that, um, I, don't, I won't bore you with the numbers here, but this, you know, look at the, the ones in red which say that the uh, net revenue losses for agriculture has been about 4% this year and about 5% loss in jobs. That's almost within the er measurement errors, I suspect. So the, the California economy, uh, according to the economists uh, in, uh, here at Davis, uh, have not suffered as much as you might think. The agricultural economy continues to grow in this fourth year of drought thanks to the state's vast but declining stores of, stores of groundwater. Of course, that's a huge issue that we need to deal with. And we're getting by, <coughs> getting by well this year, much better than many had predicted, but there's no free lunch. That's Richard Howitt. Uh, so uh, the farming sector, from an economic perspective, thanks to the groundwater, has been, has been doing okay as well. But then you look at the drought effects on the environment, you've got a very different story. 40% um, of our stream gauges are, have been recording record low uh, flows in our streams. And I'm sure we, all you work on streams are aware of that, that many streams are drying up or got extremely lower flows than you've probably ever seen before. Um, and we, we also find that environmental water tends to have a low priority in terms of use uh, in California. There's been these, for example, temporary urgency change petitions that have been issued in California to, by the State Water Resources Control Board that have relaxed environmental flow and water quality standards, essentially uh, diverting 400, um, close to a million acre feet of water from, the, from outflow in the Delta and a few other purposes for other purposes. Uh, again, and that water was essentially came at no cost to uh, the users, or very low cost. Jay Lund, who's the you know, head of the Watershed Center, gives, every, gives these different sectors a report card, and he points out, gets, gives the urban areas an A- minus for excellent preparation, but even if they sometimes show a lack of regard for others in class. Um, agriculture gets a B plus because they're good, good preparation, and also because they're highly adaptable, they're quick learners. Uh, the, the environment though gets a D, uh, unprepared for the test. Uh, yeah, essentially, really, the, the, the agency's got to be for taking, for responding quickly to uh, largely to seem what seemed to have been to them unexpected happenings because of the drought. But the environment, uh, what, but that those responses were, have not been adequate to really uh, protect the environment very well. Well, let me look at the let's look at the drought effects on our native fishes. Uh, 
There are 131 species in California. Uh, and 79% of these species are endemic either to California or to California plus one other state. So this is a California problem. These, there's not populations of these organisms elsewhere that we can rely on to save the species uh, under severe circumstances. And the various studies we've been doing on the status of California sh fishes suggest that 83% of these fish are either, have either gone extinct or in, are, are in decline or otherwise threatened by human activity. Uh, and a, a, a good example of the kind of findings we've had in recent years is this, uh, this fish species a special concern report, which uh, I'm the lead author on. We just turned into the Department of Fish and Wildlife. It's now posted on their website. There are 63 species of the 131 that I mentioned, 63 species that are in that report alone, and that's on in addition to 30 species of fish that are already listed as threatened or endangered. So that suggests that the aquatic fauna of California is not doing very well. Um, and you'll hear more about this from Jeanette Howard, I think, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, a, in a talk in a few minutes. Uh, but it's more than fish that are in just trouble. Uh, you know, fish are the worst off, I think, partly because they're the best studied and, the, um, uh, and easy, easy, relatively easy to study. But you look at this graph here, which show all the, the orange colored bars point out where, where the fish, are, fish or the species are in trouble. You'll notice that it's not just fish, but it's the amphibians and reptiles, the mollusks, the birds, the crustaceans, the plants, the mammals. They all have problems uh, in California if they're associated with aquatic environments. Uh, and it's even worse for the endemic species. Again, I hope Jeanette will talk more about this, but the, uh, if you're an endemic species in California, you're much more likely to be in trouble than if you're a more widespread species. So why are California fishes in, in such trouble? And you could say aquatic fauna in California. Again, I hope this is sort of review for you, but it's competition for water, habitat change, alien invasions, uh, coupled with the drought. And I'll cover these fairly quickly. Um, first off, we do have, we are competing with fish for water. Uh, the human population is growing, water demand has been growing in the state. Uh, and so there's this constant conflict between uh, people and fish, you could argue, or people in fisheries. And of course, we're winning. Uh, and uh, but one good indication of this is that there are over 1,400 large dams in California, that, uh, as well as thousands of small dams. Uh, this is uh, based on a study that uh, Ted Grantham and I have done uh, in, um, uh, on, on California dams. And th these dams have definitely changed the water picture in California for fish. They've fragmented the landscape, they've diverted water. In general, you find that the, they're a good sign that, we're, that w we are taking most of the water for our use and not leaving a lot for the fish. Then to top that off, there are numerous alien invasions. There are 50 species of fish that are not native to California that are present in the state, many of them quite harmful to native fish. Uh, and they're in all major watersheds of the state. So you, these fish have a one-two punch. You change the habitat with the dams, you divert the water, then you introduce fish that are adapted for the human-generated environments. And that makes it very difficult for our natives to persist. Um, I was attempting to look at this uh, in the past couple of summers by having crews go out and look at my favorite sites for native fish. These are fish that places that uh, I, Larry Brown and I cited, uh, sampled most of these places in the 1980s, um, early 1980s, and others I sampled earlier than that. And I, we sent crews out to where the best places were. Where did we find site, sites that were dominated by native fish? And they looked at 58 sites in both years. Uh, there are actually more, but this is the ones that we duplicated in both years. Uh, and what, what we found is that um, uh, 64 percent of these sites are, you know, 60 to roughly 60 percent of these sites in the two years are still dominated by native fish. Remember, we're going to the very best places. Uh, so we've lost, so if you argue roughly 40 percent of the sites have lost their native fishes, where another 25 percent are dominated by non-native fishes now, and, and about seven or eight percent were dry or contained no fish at all. So uh, that, that's either good news or bad news. It's good news in the sense it tells you the native fauna can persist despite everything we've been doing. The bad news is it also indicates that we're losing these populations one by one. Uh, and likewise, if you look at this as numbers of fish caught, total numbers in these sites, you see native fishes are dominating because that's, where, uh, that's the bias of the study. Um, 
But the number of species is surprisingly low. We're averaging three species per site, usually two native species. I haven't fully analyzed the data yet to tell you how different species are doing, but it's an indication that, that these sites have become simplified to some extent. And one of the problems we're facing, why I'm so concerned about even common native fishes, is that we have, this, we have fragmentation taking place in the landscape. Historically, California was a state that experienced big droughts and streams did dry up or become very low and have scattered drought refuges up and down the streams, usually deep pools or places in canyons where you had permanent flows, places where the fish could really hang, hang out. Uh, and this is sort of a diagram of, of, of what drought refuges might have looked under natural conditions. Uh, if you had a very severe drought and some of the refuges were lost, you'd still have at least one, one or two that would maintain themselves they could then recolonize these, the, the, the others. And we know from studies that were done in the 1970s drought, 1976-77 drought, that this recolonization can in fact happen very rapidly. So the native fishes are adapted for drought. They know how to, sp to really recolonize areas quickly once the water returns. But of course what we've done is put dams everywhere and this fragments the landscape so that the recolonization is not possible. So now if in many of these places, if we lose the fish for whatever reason, from a small stream or a refuge, whatever it is, they're probably gonna be gone for good unless we actually put them back ourselves. So California then, you can argue, is in a perpetual severe drought from, from a native fish perspective. The streams are dewatered, they're warmer, they're, there's limited access to upstream refuges, there's all these invasive species in there that are competing with the fish or preying on them, making it more difficult for them to survive. Um, and this drought demonstrates how it makes bad conditions for native fish even worse. It really pushes them to the edge because of, again, the warmer temperatures, reduced flows, less dilution of contaminants, uh, and it favors native, the non-native species. These species do tend to be better adapted for the warmer waters. Uh, and we think it also increases the number of invasions. Certainly in the Delta region, new invasions come in during drought periods. And of course, then you have your local extinctions occurring. So, and we have to look at drought then as a warm-up act for climate change, which is maybe a good thing, because we can see what's happening now with our aquatic fauna. It means that we could, should be better prepared for future droughts and for future more extended periods of time. This gives us, so we, I think it gives us some warning, some time to really do something about our aquatic flora and fauna. So what do we do? I guess that's the big question. How do we keep all these fishes around? And it's really a wonderful fish fauna. I'm sure those of you who work with invertebrates or amphibians would say the same things about the species you work with. We have all these unique forms that it'd be wonderful to keep them around in the future. So uh, I'm gonna give you briefly my ideas of, of some of the things I think we need. Of course, the first thing I think sure all of you, you would recognize is the need for a statewide strategy for aquatic conservation. We need to protect examples of all major habitats. We need self-sustaining populations of our native species, and they need some kind of a drought protection. We need to way, figure out ways to protect these species from drought. It means very active uh, statewide conservation. And of course, this starts with protecting the best of what's left. I'm sure you can all think of your favorite streams or places that are in pretty good shape, uh, but nothing in this California is gonna survive without active management and active protection. I think that's a general rule we have to be concerned about. Uh, and we have to maintain a home for every native species, figure out where each, each of these species lives and what they require, and then make sure at least some of their habitat is protected. This into a sort of this mixture of species management versus ecosystem management. But a lot of these species are really unique in terms of where they live, one or two streams. Uh, and don't we that means we need special protection for those species. And there are other species like salmon that have multiple life stages that use different habitats that migrate long distances. They have their own special problems. We also need to improve environmental flows below dams. I would love to see every dam in California evaluated for environmental flows and to figure out which ones would really benefit from improving the flows below the dams. It doesn't have to take more water if you just develop, to develop a smart flow regime. Uh, but it, it's, it's something that needs to be done and in fact the Department of Fish and Wildlife has the authority to do that if they really want to. Uh, my, I'm currently doing a, co-writing a book on floodplains, so I have to mention the idea of reconciling floodplains. It's hard to think of flood during this drought period, but the floods will come back, and in fact, what we need in California is uh, artificial floodplains that a lot of these can use, for that use them for spawning and rearing, uh, that we can flood almost every year, as uh, we think happened historically. 
Uh, and uh, above all, we need to put a price on environmental water. Right now it's undervalued. Uh, often it's given away when there's an emergency. Uh, ideally, there should be a system where in place where all environmental water has a price tag on it and you have some environmental agency or group that can, get, that can either sell it or main, keep it in the, in the in environment depending on, on the need. If you could sell the water when it is, it's possible, uh, you could generate a lot of money for ecosystem conservation. Uh, and then, then on the opposite extreme, we do need emergency rooms. Uh, some of these fishes are in the next few years, and I suspect this is true, other critters too, are gonna be on the verge of extinction. And that may mean that we need to take them in captivity for a while or create places to hold them while we wait for the environment to recover. One example of this is the UC Davis Fish Conservation and Culture Lab in Byron, which is uh, the principal home of Delta smelt right now. Uh, who knows if the Delta smelt are gonna make it in the wild, but we do know they have them in captivity. This is an extremely sophisticated facility, but we're, in it, we're going to need more of these, unfortunately. Um, so the conclusions then, uh, aquatic habitats and species are deteriorating, uh, even without the drought. So California, they're in general decline anyway. And the, when you do have a drought, the environment is what suffers the most. It's a segment of our California economy or whatever that suffers the most. Um, and one reflection of this is the severe decline our native fishes are in. Um, and drought just ex is accelerating this decline. As I mentioned, it's a warm up for climate change. So we, this gives us a warning and really of things that we can be doing. And that includes developing a statewide strategy for aquatic conservation. And it's needed for all species, and not even just fish, way beyond fish. So I'd always like to emphasize to be optimistic. There are solutions, but we will have more extinctions and more listings of um, uh, native species are threatened or endangered if we don't act soon. Uh, and there are things we can do. I can't emphasize that too much. Um, so thank you, and if there's time, I'll be happy to answer a question or two. Or do I have you all thoroughly depressed? <laughs> Hi, Peter. This is over here in this corner. Um, great talk. On, on the flip side of the drought issues, you know, we, we hopefully are going to have something from this El Nino coming up. Do you have any data or thoughts on how we've redesigned the system and the impacts of big water years where we have floods on our native fish? Is it just a good thing, or do we also wipe out some that are out there? So, so the question is, what do we, um, how, how do we respond really to floods in the future, as well as what kind of general system do we build? Um, you know, th this is where I think we have a lot of smart people in this room and elsewhere. We just need to get together and really figure out a, a coherent statewide strategy and then get it to be adopted. Uh, this is the sort of thing that the, the strategy depends on having, um, I'd say, ha having refuges essentially at streams protected all over the state. We need uh, special aquatic designations for aquatic areas. Uh, I used to call them aquatic diversity management areas, but whatever you want to call them, we need special, we need streams, lakes, whatever, with special designations. Uh, and this also includes uh, the, 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 the regulated rivers, the ones, the streams below our dams. There's enormous potential there for conservation. But we have to recognize that, that those streams then require very intense management. But I think we can do more of that uh, a, a lot better. And then when you get to floodplains and flooding, that's again generally been ignored. But the difference today is, is that we're finally recognizing that floods are a benefit to many of our native organisms. Um, and certainly the places like the Yolo Bypass and so forth can demonstrate where you can have fish and farms and birds and all these things working together uh, and I think we're going to see, be seeing more of that, more uh, green development of floodplains as green infrastructure, making them work for the environment while you also make them work for uh, flood management. Uh, so we need to be creative, thinking creatively. I don't have any magic solutions because whatever they are, whatever solutions are out there is going to take a systematic statewide effort and it's got to be, uh, have, have a widespread support not only from the biologists but from the political community as well. Uh, and this means that we have to be willing to really put out to say we want to keep our native fauna around in the future. Uh, and we, we are the people, of course, who can say these things with some authority, but we need to make sure that 
the people who, who pull the purse strings and so forth recognize this as well. I don't know if I answered your question, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, you mentioned, or you used the term warm up for climate change. And uh, I manage a 12 and a half mile um, tailwater fishery in the foothills of Fresno County. And over the past few years, we have seen population demographics among our, well, both native and non-native species mm -hmm. that we've never seen before um, in that part of our river. And my question, I guess, is, is with the drought stages that we have been seeing over the past few years, are we looking at perhaps something that we're gonna have to prepare for in the long run? Or do you think this is just part of the natural cycle? The water's gonna come back, we'll see populations flux back to where they were before. Or should we really be looking at a dynamic change in fish populations going forward in the future? Yeah, I think the latter. Uh, we are gonna see changes, but this is where actually regulated rivers are so important. Now, the one I work on, I'm most familiar with it, I do a lot of work on, is Pewter Creek right here by the Davis campus. And that has a flow regime that's designed for native fishes and a very cooperative water authority that's making this flow regime happen. It took a lawsuit, of course, to get the water. But the, yeah. but the fact is it, it is working. And what you, we have to recognize is that um, in the long run, there's going to be t times where we're going to have really severe drought, and Lake Berryessa in this case will get too low, so the amount of water being available for the environment will be very small. Um, but I, I, we know enough about the creek now to know how we can manage that. Uh, the, the, perhaps the native fish section of the creek will shrink, but in the meantime, uh, we know that when the flows come back, we can bring the native fishes back again. So there will be fluctuations. We have to be prepared for that. But we also, it may take some active management as well, maybe even mm -hmm. going out there and finding ways to reduce populations of predatory fish, uh, non-native fish. Uh, whatever we do, what, uh, each, each stream is an individual case. Each one's gonna take active management. I think that's the reality we're facing. All right, I have a follow-up. Uh, sorry if anyone else has a question. Um, we have seen a huge influx of warm water species moving up into cold water reaches uh, that have always been uh, inhabited yeah. by cold water, um, both uh, benthic macroinvertebrates and fish. Uh, and I know that the Pisces database is out there. Is there um, a good way for, I guess, people in positions like myself uh, to add to the data in the database or to use that data in the, the database uh, for management moving forward? You know, that's gonna be a great question for Jeanette Howard, who's <laughs> okay. leading the, this massive effort to get all these databases in the state together and make them accessible, not only on fish, but on invertebrates as well. Uh, that's a truly a heroic effort, and I, it, I hope it'll pay off in terms of uh, long-term improved management of our species. So I'd rather have Jeanetta answer that question at, at, at her talk. I suspect she may answer it then as well. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs>